Um, Lola, take a, take okay. us away. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, thank you very much for organizing this, Shivani. So everyone, hello. My name is Damalola Odimayo. I'm a careers advisor here at Oxford University, um, and I will be doing our presentation on introduction to banking and finance. Um, what I plan on doing is kind of just running through all the slides. There are quite a few. I think I counted 29 or 30, and then we'll answer questions at the end. Um, so I hope this is helpful for you. So, okay, just to give an overview of what we're doing today, I just want to check, Shivani, can you, has my slide moved along? Yes, yes. Fantastic. Okay. So just an overview. So um, today I'm going to give an overview of the banking and finance sector, if that's what you want to call it. Then I'm going to do a bit more of a deep dive into banking specifically, um, then into finance generally, and then a summary. I have a summary and some useful resources. Also, just so that you're aware, um, this, um, this session is being recorded, but I will also PDF this um, document so that it can be shared with all attendees as well. Okay. So Banking and finance. Um, these are terms that we hear all the time um, and they're very nebulous. And I think we all have a concept as to what we think they are. But I think um, one thing we have to accept is it's a very, very broad term that covers many different types of organizations and offer that offer a range of commercial and financial services. The words are often interchangeable. So you may hear some people saying banking and they're referring to a very, maybe just investment banking. We may hear people saying finance and they're referring to investment banking and asset management and accountancy firms. So they're used interchangeably. And what I wanted to do today was approach it a very specific way. Now, this is not necessarily the way other people would approach it, but I thought for the purposes of this session, I'm gonna split it. So I'm gonna focus on the areas that have large graduate recruitment programs, because as I'm aware, the majority of you are either currently studying or you've recently graduated. And so it probably makes more sense to um, approach the sector that way. And I'm gonna split it into two general areas, banking and finance. Now. I'm splitting it into banking and giving it, you know, a lot of um, specific, <laughs> um, specific attention because the banking recruitment process is very particular, very rigid, very fixed and actually very detailed. So I thought it would make sense to actually go into that. And also it has very rigid timelines as to what you're eligible for, et cetera. Finance, I'm using in this setting to cover a range of different areas. So including areas like private equity, investment management, constant trading, accounts to see of financial services, insurance, reinsurance. And of course, there are lots of other areas as well. I'm not trying to be exhaustive. It's not possible to be in a one hour session, but trying to give you an idea as to some of the areas you could consider and of course there are going to be resources but you know of finding about else of how excuse me finding out about other areas too so I think another thing to remember too is although I'm I'm separating and again this is just my separation it there's no this isn't officially done in the sector but I think also it's important to understand that many organizations work across a range of different areas so you have many large investment banks you have a retail banking sex section such as like HSBC and then in, um, or investment management divisions and then you also have like the big kind of what we call financial services firms such as like EYP, EYPWC who will have a corporate finance uh, cl a division they'll also have an audit division which is accountancy and also some of them even have legal divisions so I think it's important to understand that it's not a cut and dried sector but what I'm trying to do is just kind of give an intro as to how to approach it especially because sometimes the terms used are nebulous. Okay, so I thought I'd first of all give an overview of the types of organizations that typically are found. Again, as I said, you know, there are so many and I wanted to focus on the large graduate recruiters. Um, so I think one of the best known types of organization in the sector are the investment and retail banks. So these are your Goldman Sachs, your Deutsche Bank, your HSBC, your Lloyds Banking Group, you know them all, Santander, et cetera, the, one, the, firm, the banks that you bank with personally, but also the ones that you read about in the press as well. Then there are also what we call quantitative trading firms. Now, these are specialist firms which um, develop trading strategies based on quantitative analysis using trading models that they've developed. And they are very specific and a very small part of the market. They do focus more on PhD um, and master students studying STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, I don't know if there's anyone with that background on here, but I would cover them briefly. But they're, very, they're a very niche part of the market, but they still fit under this umbrella, and you might have heard a bit about them. Some of the biggest names are like Jane Street, you may have heard of, people like Octava, G Research, there are lots of other ones. 
There are also within the sector, within the sector, um, national and regional banks. So what I when I say that I'm talking about things like the Bank of England, the EBRD, which is the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, etc. I'm not going to talk about them in detail today because the way they work is slightly different. So first of all, they're not commercial banks. I mean, their names kind of tell you everything. As in, they are banks to support the financial systems in very specific countries. So they work very differently. Um, they often do have um, internship programs, etc. And each of them will run those differently. So I know for a fact the Bank of England runs, excuse me, I think first year and summer and second year summer internship programs and also for graduate roles. If you're interested in any of the international organizations like the World Bank, the EBRD, Asia Development Bank, go onto their websites. Um, it's very specific skill sets that they look for. Um, then also as well within this are the big accounting and financial services. So these are the firms like KPMG, PwC, Deloitte, EY, BGO. They're, I know that they're very active on campuses, so many of you may have come across them. So they are what we call accounting and financial services. So back in the day, like the big four, as they're called, which is PwC, KPMG, Deloitte and EY, they were known as accounting firms and that was what they did. But over the years, they have definitely branched out into more financial services, offering consulting services, and some of them even have legal departments. Then also another um, type of organization in this area is private equity and asset management firms. So these are firms like Carlyle Group, Blackstone, Fidelity, Newton Investment Management. And again, as I said, some of these big investors, well, actually all of the big investment banks will also have asset management divisions as well. So I will talk a little bit later about how to think about the type of organization you want to work with in addition to the type of work you want to do. And then also there are the insurance stroke reinsurance firms as well. So these are firms that provide insurance, uh, mainly commercial insurance, such as like Swiss Re, Allianz, Zurich, et cetera. So this is an overview of some of the organizations that fit under the banking and finance um, umbrella, but it is not exhaustive. Um, there are so many different types of organizations. I think the other piece that I missed as well is you can do finance work inside an organization. So if you think about it, every organization will have accounting teams, et cetera. So some people actually take that route. So for example, some of the large, what we call FMCG firms, which are fast moving consumer goods firms, they have specific streams, which graduate streams which are for finance specifically. So that's another option to look at. So you don't necessarily have to do finance work inverted commas within a bank and an asset management firm. You can do it in house in a corporate as well. So there are different options around this. Okay, so what skills are firms looking for? There are different skills needed for the different roles within the sector. I mean, I've just given you an idea as to how broad the sector is. So there are going to be very specific requirements for each, each firm and each specific sector. Sorry, excuse me one second. <coughs> But generally within the sector, what people are looking for, organizations are looking for, is demonstrable evidence of an interest in finance and an interest in a specific type of work. So it's not enough just to be like, oh, I'm interested in finance generally. If you're applying for an investment banking role at, say, JP Morgan, you need to also demonstrate an interest in investment banking specifically. Good quantitative skills, I think, is a given. Um, you know, if you are finance at the end of the day is dealing with numbers, so you're always going to come across numbers in some form. However, the level of quantitative ability varies from role to role. So some roles may be very quantitative indeed. So a lot of the proprietary and quant trading roles are like that, and others may have less, for example, in research. But still having good quantitative ability is important um, too. Many roles in the UK, and I'm going to really emphasize that, don't require a finance and economics degree. So um, a lot of you'll see a lot of uh, finance firms say they look at all backgrounds, etc. But you still do need to show demonstrable evidence of an interest in the sector on your CV through extracurricular activity, additional skills development, etc. Now, I said in the UK, and I said that very specifically, it's because the UK is one of the few, if not the only um, kind of job market where there is not necessarily a direct correlation between what you've studied and what you go on to do after is, whereas in other parts of the world, there is a very clear um, connection. So if you are looking to apply elsewhere, this information I'm giving you um, would not necessarily apply. So again, but just double check on each um, individual firm's website. It's also important to have a keen interest in understanding the wider concepts within finance, business and banking. And what that means is you need to be someone who gets interested or excited about, you know, a Bank of England um, declaration around interest rates. You know, someone who is reading the Financial Times every day. 
this is a this is an ever moving fast moving sector where decisions things can change very quickly and also a lot of the markets are affected not just by financial credits, uh, um, considerations but also as well ge um, you know geopolitical economic ones so we've just come out of a pandemic and we all saw what's happened there so to be successful in the industry, you have to be interested in it. I know that sounds really obvious, but I think it's important. And I think one of the best ways of learning about the industry is starting to immerse yourself in doing these things. So doing things like reading the business pages, the Financial Times, you know, et cetera, whether you're looking at Bloomberg or MSNBC, you know, finding ways to keep up to date with what's going on in not just the UK market, but global markets, because to be realistic, that is the world that we live in, especially in finance. It is almost borderless. You need a very high degree of analytic intelligence. And what that means is that you need to be able to um, basically articulate complex concepts for your clients to give them the relevant advice. So also being able to look at large amounts of data or information and understand what that means from your client's perspective. So having an analytical mind is important. I think also you need to work, be able to work well under pressure and deliver work of the highest caliber. Again, it is a very fast moving sector. Um, there are some roles which are very high pressured. I'm sure you've seen enough TV shows, trading floors, you know, et cetera. There are certain areas that definitely have more of a reputation for being harder working and more, press more pressured. So it's important to also think about, is this an environment that works for you? And I think also being realistic too in some of the roles you are expected to work pretty long hours as well. So I think, again, ask yourself that, is this an environment that's suitable? So not every single role within finance involves long hours, but there are definitely some that do. And usually the ones that involve long hours, you are also compensated accordingly. So they tend to be the highest paying roles. It's also really important to be able to work well within with people within, your, within the organization, but also with clients. So the high pressure environment, you know, it is important to be able to get on with teams because teams um, don't perform well if they don't get on well, but also as well being able to communicate well and appropriately with clients. So this is kind of a very high level overview. And I think as a baseline for any role within banking and finance, these are the, these are the skills that you need to have. But obviously, there may be much more specific technical skills that you may need and find you can find out more about those, you know, looking at job descriptions, etc. And I'll talk a little bit more about what some of those may look like. OK, one of the big questions people often ask is, how do I build experience, especially if I'm not doing a finance or economics degree? And that's perfectly fine. So there are a number of ways that you can do that. The first thing I would say is just really try and gain as much experience as you can via professional work experience programs, extracurricular activities and part time work. So this is something you should be continuously doing throughout your time at university, during university, you know, with societies or extracurricular activities and in vacations and where as well. And there are different ways of building this experience. So work experience. A lot of organizations um, offer what they call spring week or insight programs. These are usually for kind of like first year students or second year students from a four year degree, giving a taster of the kind of work they do. If you're eligible for any of these, please sign up for them just to find out more about what they do. Um, they, they can last from anything between, I think, one day to up to a week. And I've heard of some of them being as long as 10 days. But they're a really great way of just having an, getting an understanding of what it looks like sitting in a firm's office because now they're running them in, um, back in their offices um, as to what this area is. And also often in these spring weeks or insight programs, they give you an overview of all of the different divisions in the work that they do. Um, they also, the majority also offer summer internships and these can vary in length, but they're usually anything between four to 12 weeks long and they take place during the summer vacation of your penultimate year of study. So if you're doing a three year degree, that is um, your second year. If you're doing a four year degree, that's the summer of your third year. Um, so yes, definitely look at those opportunities. There are also opportunities, some of you may be at universities where as part of your degree, you do a year in industry. So a lot of firms offer one year internships to students who have completed a year of work experience as part, who need to complete a year of work experience as part of their study. So definitely look at those. Um, I think one thing to bear in mind is that some firms, especially investment banks and some investment management firms, they require you to have been completed an internship with them before they offer you a full-time position. So that is actually how they recruit. They recruit for graduate full-time positions through their internship program, basically putting all their interns through an extended, I guess, 10-week interview process. Um, I think so, in many ways that's, a great, that's great because it also gives you the opportunity to experience lots of different parts of the business. 
but also for them because they are aware of the time commitments and also the you know the very specific nature of the work that they do it they, they get to see and understand whether this is something that you're suitable to or have the capacity for however if you are if you are a recent graduate please don't worry there are still lots of opportunities for you to do internships in organizations that require you to have done an internship and i talk a little bit more about it later but right now just to let you know many banks offer what they call off-cycle internships um so they're for people who've graduated but couldn't do an internship whilst they were studying so take a look at those in fact i would say if anyone is in, is in that position look now um in preparation for this presentation i um basically went on a lot of the vacancies pages of a lot of these firms and a lot of them are, are, um, are recruiting right now um, for their off-cycle internships. So take a look. They do offer them throughout the year, but for whatever reason, maybe because this is the recruitment season, there are a lot more roles right now than I think I've ever seen when I've checked throughout the academic year. So don't worry if you feel if you didn't do a summer internship, there are still opportunities. Um, now, in addition to kind of professional internships, there are also other ways you can gain experience and exposure to the se sector. The piece I've one thing I've got to say is that with gaining experience, it's got a two, you know, it's a two, it, it, you do it for two reasons. One, to show the organization that you are interested, you've gone out of your way to do this. But I think also more importantly, for you to experience what it's like working within finance to figure out whether it's right for you, because the theory of something is very different from the reality. So even if you're studying a finance or economics degree, you may not want to practice it. You know, it's, so it's a very different thing. So I think it's to help you get an understanding as to what does this look like in real life. So I think one of the basic things is you should definitely be involved and actively with your university business and finance societies. Pretty much every single university has one. If they're running events, you should be attending them. They often have very good relationships with employers, run um, study a case study workshops, they you know all kinds of things. So you should be doing that. And I think also you can potentially get more actively involved, so like joining a committee, etc. So you get much closer and build much closer relationships with the various potential future employers for yourself. Think also about activities you can do whilst at uni um, that involve working with money. So thinking about being a treasurer for a society and those types of things or doing the accounts, et cetera. Again, that will help you to understand more about how finances work and how using other people's money in many ways, but also as well, it's demonstrable evidence from an employer's perspective that you are interested in working with money. Um, think also about extracurricular activities or personal pursuits you have that require business or finance skills. So for instance, you know, do you make extra income through eBay? I mean, also some people will trade on their own. Some people do Depop. So think about ways that you can do that too. And I think in many ways, if you are interested in finance, these are things that will probably come quite naturally to you. You should be, you should be finding yourself naturally drawn to anything that involves working with numbers, working, working with money. Another area that, you know, technical skills that you can build. So things like Excel skills can be very useful. So look for free courses and I've emphasized free. Please, please, please try to avoid paying for anything. There is a lot of free, um, free, there are a lot of free resources out there. I think also check with your university. So like IT, um, IT services may offer them or you may get them as part of your courses. So really exhaust all the free options before going to pay for it. Because to be honest, no one needs to pay. Um, no one, we want to avoid having to pay for anything thing that we don't need to at this point. And then also as well, a lot of organizations run free virtual online experiences. So they will actually put online programs on various websites like the Forage, for instance, where you can get a bit of a taster of, you know, working, you know, in, I guess, a research team at JP Morgan, et cetera. So take a look at the different types of firms that are doing those and definitely, you know, definitely try some of those. So those are, again, ways for you to kind of get a taster and understand what they do, but also as well to demonstrate that you've gone out of your way to build experience. So that sounds like a lot <clears throat> and it's, it, it probably feels a little pressured, but I think one of the things I would recommend, I would say is that, you know, there is good news. You know, this is one of the most structured graduate recruitment markets of all the different sectors, okay? Um, these firms um, have a lot of detailed information on their websites. They run a lot of internship insight, diversity programs, et cetera. And to be honest, the reason why they can do this is because they have the money to. So again, they are often very high profile on campuses because they're able to spend the money on marketing. And I think 
don't over underestimate how useful it is to have all this information at your fingertips because I work across as a careers advisor I work across a number of other sectors so for instance I work across um, international development and also um, creative careers and they have no structure so it's actually a lot harder to figure out how to find roles and you have to be that much more proactive whereas actually all of the information is pretty much there for all of the large organizations Sometimes students ask me, you know, what if I can't find the information? There isn't much information in that organization. So I always then say to people, stop and reflect. Are you comfortable applying to an organization for wh whom you don't know much about? So I think that's another piece too. But realistically, there are so many organizations um, out there that have a lot of good information. So, you know, kind of go for the low hanging fruit. Um, I think also another thing about the sector is that a lot of the um, banking and finance firms are well represented Times Top 100 graduate employers. So this is a list that the Times produces every year. Um, and I think from the 2022 to 23 list, I think there are a number of like firms like Deloitte, EY, I think Deutsche Bank were in there as well. So this list is not is actually, I guess, more about people's feedback working at the firms. It's not just about, you know, I guess, you know, salaries, etc. So take a look to see which firms firms within the finance sphere are appearing there. Now, of course, if a firm doesn't appear there, that doesn't mean that they're not a good employer to work with, but that can also kind of give you a jump off point or a list of firms to start with. Okay, so I'm now going to do a deep dive into banking. And the reason why I said I, I said earlier, I'm gonna focus on banking is because it is quite rigid and quite structured. And it's important to figure out where in the pro process you are and also what are the next steps you need to do. So this is an overview of how it generally works. But again, please do look on the individual pages of those different firms, websites, go to webinars, et cetera, just to get um, the, I, the information you need for that specific application. So kind of an overview. So typically banking is split into two areas. As I said, I'm not going to be covering kind of the national, intranational banks like the World Bank, um, Bank of England, etc. I'm going to be focusing, I think, what we traditionally think about banking. So first of all, we have the investment banks. So we have the people like, you know, Deutsche, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, UBS. They um, um, offer financial services to large organizations and high net worth individuals who want to borrow money. And then the retail banks, which, as I said, if any of us, if we have bank accounts, we all would know of as well. And again, as I said, there's a lot of crossover. So Barclays is also an investment bank. So is HSBC. And so a lot of firms work across areas. So Goldman Sachs has personal is has a much stronger personal banking imprint in the US than it has in the UK. But it has one in JP Morgan as well does in the US. I think they they work more on the, under the JP Morgan Chase banner. So there is a lot of, I would say, um, cross-pollination between the two. So I guess one of the questions that you need to ask yourself is, do I want to work in, invest in the investment banking side or I don't want to work on the retail banking side? And a lot of these, all these firms offer graduate programs too. So whether you're doing the retail banking, HSBC, et cetera. So take a look at the, but they're going to be run separately. So just take a look at the different programs that they're running. So I wanted to just get an idea, kind of an example of some of the services offered by an investment bank. So this is literally just copied and pasted from the JP Morgan website. And this is like their About Us page. So it's kind of like the, almost the landing page of the firm. So you can see there are all these divisions. So they've got investment banking, commercial banking, security services, institutional investing, private bank, markets, prime services, payments, et cetera. I think the most important thing to remember is this is what JP Morgan names their divisions. Other firms may do exactly the same, same type of work, but they actually call it something different. So this is why it's important to actually go into detail to understand what it is exactly that they're doing. Now, when I'm encouraging people to do your research for this sector, you should literally be all over their website, not just the recruitment pages, but also their client pages, because you get a very strong understanding about what they do. So you can see on, this, um, on these pages, you just click on the Learn More tab and it tells you more. A lot of banks and a lot of organizations have reports, they write articles, etc. So you should also be um, looking at those too. So again, as I going back to what I said, there's a lot of information in the public domain um, that you can look at to learn more about what it is they do. In addition, um, investment banks have um, banks have internal structures. Um, so most of the large banks have graduate roles within each part of their internal structure. So these tend to be split into, historically, they were split into areas called front office, middle office, back office. So front office is the client trading facing role. So these are the ones, you know, kind of investment banking, sales and trading, working directly with clients. Middle office was seen as like um, 
kind of like internal services. So these are the things that, you know, basically the teams that help to support the work of the front office in the sense that like risk. So the risk team will be doing um, due diligence on new clients, that type of thing, which would also um, help them with regards to deals. And then what they call back office, which is operational logistical services, technology, HR, et cetera. The language I know is a little bit dated. Very few firms use it now, but each of them call it such different things. I thought it might make it easier just to refer to that um, kind of those um, old references. But the reason why I use kind of cogs is because none of the, the bank does not function without all of these helping, if you see what I mean. So they're all an integral part of being able to deliver a service for a customer. So I think another piece you can think about if you're looking at working in banking is where do I want to be working within um, within a bank. So there are lots of different options there. But again, as I said, the firm that you look at is on, it may not use these specific terms, but they may, may call it something different. So again, look to see what the actual work is as opposed to what the title of it is. So I, this is kind of like a typical banking entry pathways. And this is the when I talked about it being quite rigid and quite specific, this is what I wanted to illustrate. Um, please don't panic. As I said, I'll send you these slides. Um, and it's a lot, it, it looks complicated, but it's actually a lot more, um, a lot more straightforward than you may think. So um, banks typically tend to engage very, very early um, in first year. When, you know, a lot of um, banks, et cetera, are hosting webinars. By the time you're back at uni next week, um, some will start hosting events. So in the first year, what they often offer, what they, um, what they offer, what they call spring weeks and insight days. So um, some may have applications already open for those and you apply to those, you complete an assessment, which often involves an online assessment. And then you do the spring week or insight program in the Easter vacation um, next year. So that'd be 2024. Um, now, if you are successful on your spring week and insight program, they can they may fast track you to interviews for a summer internship um, the, follow, the following year. However, if you do not get on a spring week or insight program, please do not panic. OK, a lot of people don't. They have very limited spaces. I think it's definitely worth applying because it does give you this insight that you want, but it, does, it doesn't It does mean, if you don't just bring week or insight program, it doesn't mean that you won't be able eligible for a summer internship, but it's just another opportunity to engage with the firm. And there are also other ways that you can engage with firms, attending webinars, et cetera, and especially engaging with um, various business and you know, banking societies or finance societies at university. Now, um, in your penultimate year, so when I say pre-autumn term, so this is around this time, any time kind of between from the 1st of September. So penultimate year would be your, um, se um, <clears throat> excuse me, just before your second year for a three-year degree and just before your third year for a um, four-year degree. This is when you apply for a summer internship. So you'd apply around now, a lot of roles are open, um, roles are open, you apply for a summer internship, you'd attend an assessment center, and then you would do your summer internship, say, next summer 2024. Now, as I said earlier, the summer internship is used essentially as a very, very long interview process for you to get to know them, for them to get to know you. Um, if sometimes you'll be interviewed, formally interviewed, sometimes they will just review your work and make an offer, ideally, to give you a full-time position, which would start once you graduate. So if you were doing a summer internship in 2024 summer, you would start your full-time and you got an offer, you'd start your full-time graduate position in 2025 September when you finished um, your role. So that is the typical route. Now, as I said, the majority of large um, investment banks require you to have done an internship with them before they, they before they'll offer you a full-time position. So if if you've done a summer internship, fantastic. If you are a final year student or a master's student and you haven't been able to do a summer internship, again, as I said, there are off-cycle internships, which give you the opportunity to do an internship with them, again, to follow that same process of then getting an offer. Now, the off-cycle internships are as I said, off cycles, so they're not necessarily as structured and they're, they're, they're offered based on availability in the various divisions. And they also vary in length. So whereas the summer ones, I tend to, tend to be maximum like 10 weeks just because of the university term times, um, off cycle internships, I've seen them lasting from anything to 10 weeks to six months. Either way, they are a great way to work within a firm that you're interested in. You also get paid at the same time um, and also as well to do that internship, um, get, get the opportunity to do that internship too. So please don't, don't worry if you're in your final year or doing a one-year master's um, and you haven't done the internship. They do give you opportunities to do internships at other times of the year, but just keep an eye out as, they, as, as these opportunities come up. 
Okay, as I mentioned, application timelines are very different. Um, they tend to, to um, are very rigid. They tend to close around October, early November, but the majority, I think, if not all of them, recruit on a rolling basis. So they will interview candidates as and when applications are submitted. So if they opened application on the 1st of um, September, they've probably already started putting um, candidates through the interviews process right now. So I think getting in as early as you possibly can um, and also ensuring your preparation is completed well in advance. Do not waste the deadline because most roles are filled by then. Now, if you find yourself kind of sitting here listening to and thinking, you know what, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not ready to apply. I don't have enough experience, um, but the deadlines are coming up. Should I just put in an application? I think again, take a moment to reflect. As I said, there are off-cycle internships. So ask yourself, would it make more sense to wait and apply for an off-cycle internship when you've built up more experience, et cetera, to put in a strong application? I think it's also important to remember some firms may have rules around how often you can apply within a very specific time frame. So double check that too, because some firms will make you wait 12 months, et cetera. Some don't mind. I mean, but I think just check because you don't want to waste that application. You want to make sure that it's going to be the best possible one that you can um, submit for that firm. Okay, so that's kind of banking. As I said, I went into a bit more detail just because it's a little bit more rigid in terms of how they recruit. But um, I think the main thing I would say with banking is go onto the firm individual websites. They will talk in a lot of detail about their expectations, the job descriptions, the timelines, etc. That's the best source of information for these banks. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to finance, um, which again, this very nebulous term that I'm going to desperately try and, I don't know, categorize. So again, as I said, a very large number of organizations undertaking very different work grouped under the term finance. Um, and each organization area recruits differently. So I mentioned quantitative trading firms, national regional banks, accounting financial services, private equity and asset management, and insurance firms. And what I'm going to do next is just say, talk a little bit about, um, just have a slide on each of those areas just to give you um, some info. But there, but you again, there are ways of getting much more detailed info just to understand kind of where they sit in the market. So <clears throat> within finance, as I said, we talked about all those different areas, or if you want to say banking and finance, one of the big decisions you have to make is what type of work do you want to do? So yes, everything sits under the banking and finance umbrella, but actually what do you want to do? I always say to people, follow your interests. And when I say follow your interests, I mean, follow your subject matter interests, because that's going to define which firm or which type of work is best for you. So for instance, are you interested in working in pension funds? If so, maybe an investment management uh, firm would work. Do you want to do quantitative trading, quantitative trading firm, or even investment bank that has a quantitative trading team? You know, do you want to get a qualification, say for instance, an accountancy or a CFA? So think about the subject matter of what you do. So all of these organizations work with money to be, you know, to be very basic and blunt, but what do you want to be doing with it? What kind of clients do you want to work with? The next decision is, you know, what kind of organization do you want to work in? So as I said before, organizations often work across a range of different areas. So for instance, you can do accountancy in an accounting firm or a financial services firm, but you can also get a co accountancy qualification in a corporate too. You know, you can be an investment manager at a large investment bank, or you could be an investment manager in an investment management firm. So thinking about those types of organize, those types of air, those types of questions can be helpful. If you're not sure, that's fine. Look at the diff, look at all the other options out there and think about your personality and which environments you think are best, you're best suited to. I think another piece I didn't mention in terms of trying to figure out which environment you're best in, uh, suited to is engage with those firms, attend webinars. If they're running in-person in events, go and talk to them. You get a much stronger understanding about their culture and whether you feel that it fits for you by actually engaging. Because at the end of the day, if you're just looking on a website, you know, they all look very similar. So trying to understand that nuance often comes with engaging with them and asking your own very specific questions. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little about counseling and financial services. So the most recognizable firms in the area, the big four, you may have heard of them, EY, PwC, Deloitte, KPMG, but there are many more than that. BDO, Grant Thornton, a couple of the other big ones. So don't limit yourself. But I think, you know, they are probably the most prominent on campuses and do a lot um, on the graduate recruitment space. And also as well, they are, they have met, a lot of them have offices in many places in the UK. So somewhere like PwC will have, you know, dozens of offices across the whole of the UK. So you don't have to be London based. I think that's another thing I forgot to mention too. Although London is a financial cap, global financial capital, you can do finance work outside of London. So again, as I mentioned, financial services firms have offices outside 
outside of have offices in cities and big towns across the UK. Um, and also as well, some of the large investment banks have some of their teams in different parts of the country. The reality is a lot of the work will be London based. And that's in many ways, that's why sometimes the salaries are higher. But there are also other places that you can look at. Many offer internship and graduate roles in multiple locations, as I mentioned. Um, they work advising businesses in many industries and across a range of services. So like one of the big financial services firms could be working on like audit, which is accounting, risk, human capital management, pensions, tax, corporate finance, a whole range of different things. So again, read more and research more in the different parts of work that they do and think about, you know, OK, which is the thing that excites me and interests me most. Some roles would require you to gain a qualification. So for instance, if you audit at one of the big four, you would need to get the accounting qualification, but they'll support you through your studies um, as well. So I think that's important to think about. Um, they all have, they, the larger firms have structured work experience, graduate programs, and the graduate recruitment period is usually, is basically now September to December. Um, this is the typical, I guess, graduate recruitment period. You probably already know this, um, but yes, it's around now. But again, I would say engage as soon as you can. And I think the fact you're on this call means that you're engaging early. So that's absolutely fantastic. Now, asset management. So these asset management firms, um, these are firms that manage investments on behalf of others. So for instance, pension funds, governments, high net worth individuals to increase their portfolio and also mitigate risk. Um, many, most investment banks have asset management divisions as well. But again, as I said, there are standalone asset management, very successful asset management firms like BlackRock, you may have heard of, Fidelity, Bailey Gifford, Aberdeen, there are lots of them out there. Um, their graduate recruitment timeline is different for each firm so check their websites but I think it's similar to investment banks um, so I in all honesty because I think the investment banks go so early everyone is moving their processes as closely as they can to theirs so basically I'd say about now um, you should be looking and you know, doing your research looking for deadlines and the rest of and ways of engaging with these organizations. So quantitative pro proprietary trading, it is a very specific area that looks at very specific um, skill sets. I'm not sure if anyone in the audience is a PhD or not, but this is an area where a lot of PhDs and STEM subjects are interested. So these firms such as Jane Street, G um, GIS Research, Optiva, there are lots of them, are known as electronic market makers. So they develop trading strategies based on quantitative analysis using automated trading models they have created. And because these roles require a very, very high degree of quantitative ability and also as well software off sometimes software engineering. They almost they exclusively look for minimum masters or PhDs in STEM subjects that's science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, Again, there are bigger ones on the market, have strong big graduate programs. They're not all UK based. Um, so some of them had are headquartered in places like the Netherlands, et cetera, even though they have um, London offices. So, but this is a very specialist area. Now also there are quantitative trading teams within the big investment banks, but again, it's very niche. Um, but if anyone is here as a PhD um, and is interested in learning more, just go on any of these firms listed websites um, and take a look to see what, you know, what they're looking for. And they're actually quite good in terms of the details of the skill set that they're looking for. Internships and graduate positions are available. I was just looking on a few websites and I saw those. And I noticed that they have slightly more flexible recruitment timelines and tend to recruit throughout the year. So some of them just have vacancies pages at various levels. But I actually think in many ways, you know, it would make sense to kind of go with the flow now because they also understand that, you know, a lot of their competitors or other um, organizations working in the finance space are recruiting right now. So if you have any finance fairs at your, your university or anything like that, they may also turn up at some of, be there at some of your science and engineering fairs, because again, as I said, they look um, for STEM uh, PhDs and master's students, take a look at them too. So I would say, do even though each firm's recruitment process is slightly different, I think this is the right time to be looking at a lot of this information. Private equity, again, is quite a niche area, but people throw that firm, that phrase around. And I'm sure you, some of you may have seen certain TV shows um, where, where private equity, which have private equity firms in the So P firms, as they're sometimes called, they earn money um, by charging management performance fees for investors in a fund. So for instance, a fund may acquire a company, improve its performance by restructuring and selling it. Um, there are large firms in this area. So you may have heard of Blackstone, Carlyle Group, and KKR. A small number offer internships and graduate entry roles, and they tend to offer a very small number of those. Um, and the recruitment timeline is usually pretty much the same as that of banking. The only thing I would say is that, again, it's a very small number that offer in this area. And that's also quite recent. So 
I'd say 10, 15 years ago, like none of them would have hired graduates because they would typically hire former investment bankers um, to work within this area because it's highly specialized work, but some do offer graduate entry roles. But um, yeah, it's a, very, it's a very similar timeline to the big investment banks. And then insurance reinsurance. So I think we all kind of know what insurance is. If you had but had car insurance, etc. So it's you know, organize you know firms which are offering a guarantee of compensation against loss or damage. The bigger ones are doing a combination of com mainly commercial, but they might also have some personal in there. And reinsurance is basically where um, an insurer themselves they will transfer all or part of the risk to another insurance to limit their risk against the first insurance if they feel there's too much there. So like a big reinsurance from a Swiss Re. Um, um, Zurich and Allianz, um, they are also insurance firms and there's AXA, Aviva, I'm sure you've heard of lots of other ones out there, but these were ones that I looked at and saw that they actually have open um, graduate programs right now here in the UK, so I mentioned them specifically, but again, as I said, there are others, these are just the ones that I came across. Okay, so I'm coming towards the end and there's a lot of information, um, but try not to be overwhelmed. So what I thought would be helpful is to give you kind of some tips as to how to approach this. So the first thing I always say to people, no matter which sector you're interested in, it could be creative industries, film and TV, engineering, it doesn't matter. The starting point is research. And I have put it in red, research, research, research. It is the most important thing you do because without the research, you cannot understand the industry and you cannot put together strong, strong applications. So do your research. So one of the approaches I recommend is, first of all, wherever you are in your decision making, and it doesn't matter where you are, so don't feel, oh, I'm far behind, etc. It's about you. Define what your objective is right now. So if your objective is just to learn more about firms and sectors, that is fine. And then that's what your research should be based on. However, if your research is focused on your, your, your objective is to find internships, full-time positions, that also will change you know, the focus of your research. So I think define where you are, but be honest with yourself and don't feel bad that you're not as far ahead as you know, the same position as your friends, etc. Ignore that. It doesn't matter. This is your journey. So you need to you go, you need to go at your own pace based on who you are and your circumstances. Identify potential resources. And as I said, there's a page on resources and I've mentioned some of the ones through. Approach the information with an open mind. This is a learning exercise and that's what research is. So drop any preconceived ideas about how the sector or how firms recruit. There are so many rumors that go around campus around what firms do, what their processes, etc. Please ignore them. Unless you are hearing it from the mouth of the HR or the recruiter from that firm, always take it with a pinch of salt because I've heard stories about firms where people said, oh, they do this. They ask that question. I know for a fact it's not true because I just had a conversation with their recruiter. So be very, very careful about the noise. I know it's quite difficult not to listen to it, but focus again on your path. And that's the most important thing. Get verifiable and credit, you know, verifiable and also um, credible information. And that is often from the firms themselves. Gather and record relevant information. So there is a lot of information you're going to come across. Use an Excel spreadsheet. You're interested in finance, you should get you know used to using Excel. So even use Excel spreadsheet to save things like you know the word searches that you've put in. Say for instance, you want to find out which are the top twenty finance graduate programs, etc. You know, you know, save that because as you know, if you do a Google search, changing just one word changes the search as well. So use an Excel spreadsheet for that. Um, and also use all that information to help you make decisions about which roles interest you, who, how, when to apply. As with any research, you have to start very, very broad, and then it will narrow itself as you go through. Um, that's just the reality. There are no shortcuts. That is the nature of research. If any of you are doing, you know, um, whether you're doing a written degree or not, there, you can't, you can't get, get around that. So it's really important. I think also the research process as well can help to refine your interest. If you are struggling and you're not finding it interesting, my recommendation is to take a moment and pause and think, is this really the right career for me? Because if it's not exciting you and not interesting you, it's definitely not going to kind of in the pressured environment of work where there are very high expectations. So also ask yourself whether this is really right for you as opposed to what you think sounds good or looks good. Okay, so summary. Um, as I said, it's a really large sector offering really a large number of internships, graduate opportunities, and also, as I'm sure you're aware, very high salaries, and it's very structured, and I think that's very nice from a um, student's perspective. It's competitive, but don't panic, because with good research, relevant experience, you should be able to find the right roles for you. The sector is also, um, you know, 
let, let's be honest, you know, historically, the sector has not been great in terms of diversity. So it's really committed now. And you, I'm sure you've seen lots of programs, you know, focusing on, you know, historically underrepresented groups. So women, students with disabilities, I think minorities, first generation uh, people at university. So if you're eligible to apply to those programs, please do. So I think you already do anyway. There's a reason why you're on this 10K interns call. But if you find any other, any programs like this, please do engage. The reason why I think it's very helpful to engage in these programs because they tend to be smaller. So what they allow you to say, for instance, you go for an open day or something like that, you can ask very specific questions. You know, you get to be noticed as opposed to be sitting in a room with 300 other people as well, just listening to a big presentation. So use these opportunities. And as I said, the fact that you signed up to this um, indicates that you're happy to do so. So I would recommend doing so. One of the things, um, I won't go into too much details, but I will just mention, so if there's anyone on the call with a disability, um, also a lot of these firms do make, do, well, by law, they are required to make reasonable adjustments if you require them for your disability, but some of them have very strong um, um, disability su um, uh, support programs as well. So also, if you go to any of these events, speak to their recruiters, but um, you can also find out information on our website about, you know, whether to disclose your disability, how to do so, and there are a number of organizations that can support you with that. One I will just mention is called my plus consulting it's a student organization we don't run it it's not related to us but they're absolutely fantastic and actually do a lot of work in the corporate sector and have a lot of free events for students in banking and finance specific so my plus consulting um just remember that so go on their website and register with them um, and as I said, there's a lot of information in the, in the sector, in the public domain, so please use it. There is a lot. It may feel overwhelming. Break it into small pieces. So if you feel that this is a lot and it's overwhelming, set yourself one task. So for everyone here, if you can access it for free, if your university has a subscription, read the Financial Times every morning. You know, So break it into smaller pieces. Also lots of free resources that I mentioned that, you know, so there's obviously our career service briefings on our website um, and we have briefings on banking investment, accountancy, actuarial work as well. Prospects, you know, which is a fantastic website. They give detailed job profiles so you can put in like insurance underwriter and it talks in detail about what the requirements are. The Forage, which is an online learning platform, which a lot of these large um, corporations put um, short um, kind of like six to eight hour exercises on Target Jobs, which is another great graduate publication of shows vacant Agencies, career application advice for a range of sectors, including finance. They used, to, I think, they still make the books. Um, or the, actually, they may not. So they used to have these like books for all these different sectors back in the day. But maybe post pandemic, um, they don't have a physical copy. E financial careers again, a great finance um, careers advice and job site. As anyone interested, Financial Times again. Check if your university has a subscription, so you don't have to pay for it because it is quite. Um, expensive if you can't get access to financial times think about you know business pages a free newspaper so i think the guardian doesn't have a paywall and they have you know business section as well and then also firm individual websites they are your best source of information but go beyond that see if you can sign up for a webinar to listen to anything that they have to say about their programs or what they're looking for <laughs> 